My name is David Dominguez. I am one of the deacons here at Aletheia Church, and I have the great privilege of preaching this morning. But before we start that, if you have elementary school age children, this is the time to send them with the Aletheia Junior volunteers right here to my right. Um, and then also, we will be in John chapter 9. We've been going through the book of John. And if you have not gotten one yet, we would love to give you a scripture journal. The scripture journals just have the book of John on one side and then a place for you to take notes on the other side. So if you're interested in getting one of those, just raise your hand and um, one of our volunteers will get one in your hands. We, we would love nothing more than for you to have the word of God in your hands this morning. I would like to start our sermon today with a word of prayer, um, and then we'll really get into it, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the light that he is for the world. I, I thank you for sending us a Savior. I pray that our eyes would be open and we would worship you this morning, and that ultimately we would give you all the honor and glory in our lives. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. So as you guys just heard, we're going to be in John chapter 9, verses 24 through the end of the chapter. So that means there's 23 verses that we're not going to really cover today because Dan Green preached on them last week. So if you have not heard that sermon, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. But I did think it would be worth recapping at least some of the major ideas because they lay the foundation for the interactions that we see in today's verses. So in the first 23 verses, we saw Jesus healed a man who was born blind. And this is a big deal for multiple reasons, right? right? Healing someone who is born blind is kind of a big deal in and of itself, but it was also seen as a messianic sign in the Old Testament. So in Isaiah 35, verses 4 through 5, it says, Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open. And we actually see this in the Gospels as well. In, in Luke chapter 7, when John the Baptist is in prison and he sends his disciples to go talk to Jesus and the disciples are, are to ask Jesus if he's really the Messiah. They're like, hey, are you really the one? Or are we supposed to be like looking for somebody else? Jesus tells them to go back and tell John the Baptist what they have seen. And one of the signs that he lists in verse 22, he says, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised. And so this is a big deal. This is a messianic sign. The Pharisees do not like this. They do not like that Jesus has healed this man. So as we saw last week, they start interrogating him. They start interrogating his family because they don't like the story that he's telling them. He's just telling them exactly what happened to him. I mean, this guy was blind just a few days ago, and he's just telling them exactly what he has experienced. They don't like it. They bring his family in. The family does not want to get involved. They do not want to get kicked out of the synagogue. So they say, yes, that's my son. Yes, he was born blind. He's a grown man. You guys should just go and, and talk to him. So they really don't want any part of it. So the Pharisees don't like that. And that's exactly where we pick up today. They are still very upset. They're mad because, according to them, Jesus has healed on the Sabbath, which they don't like. This has already been addressed by Jesus, by the way, previously. But they also have a problem with how he healed him, right? He, he made mud, which is considered work, which, according to them, they shouldn't be doing on the Sabbath. So they start to interrogate this man for a second time, and that's where we uh, pick up today. They are really, really upset um, and in these interactions, we're really going to see um, the response of humans to the light of Jesus. And we're going to see three major uh, responses. When, when the light of Jesus shines, we're going to see spiritual blindness. We're going to see spiritual sight. And then ultimately, we're going to see judgment. And so let's go ahead and get into it. We're going to start with spiritual sight. But before we define our terms, I, I thought a practical personal story would probably help with um, making sense of some of these terms. I feel like I share 
too much of my medical history when I'm up here. Um, yeah, you guys know a little bit too much about me at this point, but um, it's, not, it's not a secret that I wear glasses, right? And I didn't always wear glasses. In fact, I went to private school like my whole life. So I did not need glasses. Most of my learning was up close and personal. There was no, no reading like a board very far away. I wasn't in any large auditoriums, nothing like that. And so I never really realized that I needed glasses until I got to college. And even it took a while in college because I'm, I'm kind of a nerd. So I like to sit up front because I get distracted. Even here, I sit like in the second row. So I get distracted. So I try to sit first, second, third row. Never had any problems. Back then, professors didn't just give you PowerPoints. You had to like write down what they write on the board. So, you know, I would take my notes, didn't really have a problem, except once I started Anatomy and Physiology 1. This was in a, a class that was in a large auditorium, and I had a class right before it. So what would happen is I would always show up, first four rows already taken, had to sit way back in the class, could not see anything. So what I would do is, during bathroom breaks, I would go up, take pictures with my phone of what the professor had written, and then go back to my desk and kind of like make sense of the notes that I had written from what he was talking about, what I thought he had highlighted. And so one day the professor stops me and says, David, what are you doing? Like he, he thought I was really smart. He thought I was just taking pictures and then studying off that. And then I told him, no, I'm not doing that. I just take the pictures and then I go back and write this stuff down. And he's like, why don't you just go like see an eye doctor or get glasses. Have you ever like thought about that? So he confronts me with my, my visual deficit. And I said, you know what? I just had not crossed my mind. So not to bore you guys, I tell my mom, she takes me to the Oaks Mall. Back then, the Oaks Mall had a lens crafters inside the mall. Some of you are laughing because you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's part of the story, so that's why I include it. Um, I, I promise it'll make sense in the end. Um, and then we go, they, they do all the visual assessments, right? They put that chart right in front of you to see how well you see with one eye, with the other. It's called a Snellen chart. I'm not a visual expert. I had to look it up. Um, and they determine how well I see with each eye. They figure out which lens I need, and they give me glasses. And man, was that a life-changing experience. I walked out of that lens crafter to the mall, and I was looking at people, and just I would turn to my mom and my sister, and I would say, have you guys always been able to see people's faces this clearly. Like, I felt like I could see inside of people's souls. I was like, the, the people who I thought had wrinkles, they have even more wrinkles than wrinkles. Like, it was, it was crazy. I, I, I could see so clearly. And I was thinking about this last week as, as Dan was talking about this man receiving sight and going from being blind. It's like, if I, was, if I thought that was a life-changing moment for me, I can only imagine the life-changing event of this man going from being blind to, to seeing. And, and, and even in a bigger sense, what we'll see today, going from being spiritually blind to having spiritual sight. So we're going to use those terms a lot. So let's go ahead and define them. So when, when we assess someone's vision, right, we have to have something to tell us how well they see, right? I, I spoke about the Snellen chart. Well, our Snellen chart is going to be the person of Jesus Christ. He is who determines if we are spiritually seeing or spiritually blind. And so when we say that someone has spiritual sight, we say that they can clearly see Jesus for who he truly is, Lord, Messiah, and needed Savior. <clears throat> and, and we'll see this in our story with the blind man towards, towards the end, right? He's going to come to this clear realization of who Jesus truly is, and he will believe and worship. And then... We're also, we're also going to see uh, spiritual blindness, which is the opposite of that, right? It is the inability to see Jesus for who he truly is. And we're going to see two different presentations within our narrative today of spiritual blindness. And this is where I think my story kind of will help us make sense of just how, how the difference between one and the other, right? So, so the first presentation of spiritual blindness is what I call the the humble blind, which is just the, the healed man who is for sure in spiritual darkness, right? He is lost, but he demonstrates humility and understanding that he doesn't have all the answers, right? That's, that's the blind man in our story. And kind of like myself, right? When my professor tells me, hey, you, why are you taking pictures of, of this board when you can just go get glasses. I'm like, oh, this sounds like a great idea. I should probably look into that. Um, I promise you, I'm, I'm, I just didn't know about it. Um, so that's, that's one presentation. And then there's the second presentation, 
right? The, the proud blind, right? Those who think that they see, the, these people are so certain that they, that they see and know who Jesus is that they utterly reject the, any suggestion to the contrary, and then they just confirm their own darkness. And, and clearly in our story, the example is the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees, uh, in my story, would be the student who the professor says, hey, you should just go, go to the eye doctor and get glasses. And they're like, no, actually, I see fine. I think everybody, I don't think anybody can see from the fourth row, even though like everybody next to you is taking notes and they're like, no, dude, we totally see fine. I don't know what your problem is. They're like, no, we're, I, I see 100% fine, just doubling down, prideful. I don't need help from anybody, right? We, we, we laugh. Because we say that would be such a silly position to have when I'm standing up every bathroom break to take a picture of the board. Clearly, it's not working out. But I might be too prideful. And that's where the Pharisees are, right? They're, they're in denial. They don't want to see Jesus as, as the Messiah, as their needed Savior. They are too arrogant and too prideful to come to that conclusion because it would mean what? That they're wrong. Right? It, for me to go to the eye doctor, I have to first admit that I cannot see well. That is the first step that I, have to, that I have to complete. And they refuse to do that. And in fact, this is why Jesus says that he speaks in parables. Right? In Matthew 13, 13, he says, This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Right? The, the parables mean something to those who have spiritual sight. But, but to somebody else, right? The, to, to those who are spiritually blind, it's just a story about seeds and a sower. And I don't know why you guys care about agri- agriculture that much, right? And, and that's where the Pharisees are with Jesus and his claim to being the Messiah. They're just blind to who he truly is, to what he is trying to get them to understand. They don't realize how desperately they need him. And this becomes very apparent in our narrative when we see the questions that they ask, right? They, they tell the man, they're like, hey, you should be giving glory to God, right? Because they don't see Jesus as the son of God who is doing everything according to the father's will and for the father's glory, they then say, this man must be a sinner, right? Because they, they don't see Jesus as the sinless, spotless lamb who takes away the sin of the world, right? They, they, they say, we don't even know where this guy came from, which, by the way, is really interesting because a few chapters ago, they said he couldn't be the Messiah because they were very sure where he came from, which just really shows you how confused they are, that they confuse themselves. But it's because they don't see him as the son sent from the father, right? Who, whom the father's voice when he was being baptized says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. They do not see Jesus as that. And at, at the end of the day, I think one of their, their biggest gripes is that they don't see Jesus as the perfect fulfillment of the law, right? They think Jesus is here to compete with Moses and the law when Jesus has made it very clear that it is Moses and the law that that speak of him, that point towards the need for a Savior and a Messiah. In fact, in John 5, a lot of these issues he's already addressed with, with, with these people, but in John chapter 5, verse 45 through 47, Jesus says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe in his writings, how will you believe my words? You see, they, they don't see Jesus for who he truly is, but most importantly, they don't see their need for Jesus. They don't see their need for a savior. They have placed all of their trust in Moses and the law, and it's actually the law that is condemning them. It's actually the law that will accuse them because they can't. They can't live that perfect standard in life that they have even set for themselves. They have the light of the world and the savior of the world right in front of them, but they just refuse to come to him. And in that same passage in John 5, this is exactly what Jesus tells them in verses 39 through 40. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness of me. Yet, you refuse to come to me that you may have life. They're in denial. 
they're arrogant, they're prideful, they refuse. They have the light of the world, the savior that they desperately need, and they just refuse to come to him. And that's, that's practically what spiritual blindness looks like. And it's very easy to pile on the Pharisees. It's very easy to say, these people are so out of touch. How can they not see who Jesus truly is? But this is not a foreign concept for humanity, right? We humans haven't changed all that much. There are plenty of people who know a lot about the Bible, know a lot of biblical content, know a lot of doctrine, can quote scripture. Heck, there are people who teach New Testament, Old Testament, at a university level, and yet when we look at their lives, it is clear that they are spiritually blind because they don't see Jesus for who he is. They don't see him as Messiah. They don't see him as Savior that they desperately need. He's not the Lord of their lives. They don't know him as beautiful, as all-satisfying, as the highest treasure of their life. They know him in the same way that the devil and the demons know him that God exists. And we, we don't want to know God that way. That's, that's not how we want to know God. They don't see Jesus as the treasure that makes all other things pale in comparison. Right When Paul is, is writing to the, the Philippians in chapter three, he demonstrates what spiritual sight looks like by telling them that he counts everything everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. That's, that's what spiritual sight looks like. It, it, when people look at your life, they have to clearly see that everything else in your life that are good things, your family, your job, your career, uh, what, whatever, whatever you, is coming into your mind right now, fill that in there. All of those things can be good, but they are not your ultimate treasure. Christ is, right? That's what, that's what that looks like. But to the spiritually blind, every other treasure is more worthy to follow than Jesus. Money, career, intellect, family, all of those are more appealing than Jesus. They don't see him accurately, which is a problem, but more importantly, they don't see the need for him, just like these Pharisees. They think they can establish their own moral code, that they can answer every question with just logic and reason. They think that we've evolved past the need for God. They don't see Jesus as treasure because they think all other treasure is better. And in the same way that we're going to see that Humility leads to seeing and knowing God, which leads to spiritual sight. We see that pride and self-knowledge lead to blindness and a life in spiritual darkness. And a life in, in spiritual darkness ultimately is all about yourself, right? It lacks purpose. It, it lacks eternal purpose. It lacks moral guidance. Because think about the, the practical explanation of that, right? If you're living in darkness... What, what's going to happen? You're probably going to trip up. You might not know where you're going. It, it's going to be very difficult to move around. In fact, last week, the lights went out for like a second. And if we would have tried to do setup like that with all the lights, a lot of people would have been like impaled with the bars that, that, that hold the tarps, right? It would be really hard to get things done if we were working in darkness. And so in the same way, that's what happens when we decide to live our lives in darkness, a way Away from the light of the world that is Jesus, our natural bent is towards sin and shame, right? We want to cheat, lie, steal, do anything to get ahead, right? Like that's, our, that's like our human, human natural desire. We'll just do anything in order to get ahead of the other person. If you've ever been in a, like a competitive college program, like you know exactly what I am talking about. And in, in John eleven ten, 10, uh, we, we hear this, it says, but if but if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. That's just going to be natural, right? Like if we're walking away from Jesus, if we're living our lives away from him, we're going to stumble because we're walking and living in the darkness. And I want to clarify, this, this isn't dependent on 
Like your business might be super successful. You might have like a bunch of letters behind your name. Like from the outside looking in, from, from humans perspective, we're so nearsighted. They might say, oh, their life looks pretty good. This is, this is great. But those are all nearsighted outcomes when determining success and value. Right? In, uh, in, in his book, Crazy Love, Francis Chan says, our greatest fear should not be a failure but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. And so if, if, if we want to do the opposite of that, if we want to not live in darkness, we have to go to God who knows what actually matters, right? To, to tell us what actually uh, matters. In, 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 in the Psalms, we're told that God's word is supposed to be the lamp into our feet and the light into our path, right? We are supposed to go to him and his words in order to have guidance, in order to to realize how we ought to live, how we ought to treat others, how we are to invest, how we are to prioritize what our identity is, what our ultimate purpose is. But if this is you this morning, if you don't see Jesus as Lord and Savior, you don't see him as the most valuable treasure you could ever possess. If you feel like you're just walking through life aimlessly with no purpose or moral compass and, and you're trying to, you're like, I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to grow spiritually. I want, I want to, to grow my spiritual garden, but you're do, trying to do it without the light of the world and you're aware of it, then I would say, praise God because it is not too late. It is not too late. It is in our story today that the humble, blind man is blessed and healed. That is the same thing that can happen for you. You can come to Jesus, who is the light of the world. He can give you spiritual sight. And this this doesn't just mean he offers you uh, guidance and and forgiveness, which, which he does. But he is actually offering to reveal God to you. That is his offer. But the Pharisees just lack the the, the, the awareness and and, and the spiritual blindness. They they can't see this, and they just are bullying this man, and they they cast him out. They're like, we don't like what you're saying. Get out. They kick him out of of the synagogue. And again, they just are demonstrating their spiritual blindness in action. This is what living in darkness looks like, total wickedness. They excommunicate a man from the synagogue just because he told them the truth. They ask the blind man who now sees what happened, he tells it to them, we don't like it, get out. Think of of how clearly an example of spiritual blindness and living in darkness that is. And as the Pharisees are doing this, as, as they're casting this man out, we're getting an example of what going from spiritual blindness to spiritual sight actually looks like. The blind man's actually undergoing spiritual LASIK eye surgery right before our eyes. No pun intended there. There's a lot of eyes in there. And so what we're going to see is him, him undergoing that and going from spiritual blindness to spiritual sight. Because the Pharisees cast him out, and what happens? This is the best part of the whole story. Jesus comes to him. I love that. I love the simplicity of that. The the Pharisees cast him out, and Jesus comes to him. The Jews have excommunicated him, but Jesus comes to him even though he still doesn't know exactly who Jesus is. He hasn't connected all the dots. He hasn't done everything he needs to, yet Jesus still comes to him. Jesus is coming to reveal himself to him. He has already opened his physical eyes, as we saw last week, and now it's time to open his spiritual eyes so that he might gaze upon the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And most importantly for him, he's his own sin. And, I, and I'd like to contrast the, the posture of the, um, the blind man who is healed with the Pharisees, right? Because unlike the Pharisees, we see that he has this posture that is so ready to believe and to worship. When Jesus confronts him and says, have, have, 
have you, like, do you know who the son of man is? He goes, tell me, tell me who he is and I will go and worship him, right? And, and we see in this story, this progressive clarity from the, the blind man who is now, I would call him the, the healed man because he's no longer blind. In, in verse 11, when they first ask him who healed him, he says, oh, this man named Jesus. And then by verse 17, he's already calling him a prophet, right? And it's not till verse 38 when he says that, that he calls him Lord and eventually worships him. Which, by the way, I don't want to gloss over that because that's a huge deal. This guy's dropping down, worshiping Jesus, which if Jesus is a true and honest prophet, he should tell him to stop doing that, right? In fact, in Acts 14, when Paul and Barnabas heal people and they are trying to worship them, look at what they tell the, the, the men. He says, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So Jesus right here is making a clear claim to divinity. He's not telling them to stop worshiping him because unlike Paul and Barnabas, it is by him and through him that everything was made that was made. And it is, it is, it is for him and through him that all things hold together. He is not just a mere man like Paul and Barnabas. He is the God of the universe in the flesh. And so he doesn't tell him to stop worshiping. He's doing the, the, the thing that he is actually supposed to do when we see Jesus clearly. And the blind man probably can still not accurately articulate what's going on or what he's experienced, much like with his uh, physical vision, but he's unable to deny it. Right? We, we saw that last week. Even when, when faced with pressure um, and ridicule, he, he's unable to deny what has happened to him. And, and by the way, this response is the only response that we can have when we're confronted with the person of Jesus and we see him clearly. This is the only response we believe and we worship. If we see Jesus truly for who he is, if we're no longer spiritually blind, we believe and worship we worship. In fact, this, this happens uh, in Matthew 14 uh, when Jesus is walking on water, right? Uh, Peter tries to do the same thing. doesn't go as well. Eventually, they both get back into the boat, and, and the wind ceases. And look at what happens in verse uh, 33. It says, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. They believe right? They confess, you, truly you are the Son of God, and then they worship Him. And this is, this is the reality for anyone here who claims to be a believer, that at one moment you can say, I was indeed blind, but now I see. And it is only Jesus, the light of the world, who can give us that sight. In, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, I, would, like, I wish I could preach on this sermon this sermon, like just on this verse, because it's so good. Um, in, in verse six, it says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We as Christians have spiritual sight because God has shown into our hearts to give us the light that is the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus and I, I pray, my, my prayer this morning is that everyone leaves here able to say that, able to truly believe that, for that to be the reality of your life. That yes, I've tried other things at the center of my life, whether it's money, uh, my career, pleasure, knowledge. I've tried to make my religious performance or my family or even myself my own God. And all of them failed me as they ultimately will. We can't, we can't put up with that weight and that pressure. But now I see Jesus for who he is, Lord, beautiful, all satisfying, and the highest treasure of my life, the only light that can overcome this world of darkness. And I don't know about you guys, but this world is really, really dark. Like week by week basis, there's just, if you just listen to the news or if you just take, take a step back at your job situation, your interactions, you just see so much 
darkness in the world, so much difficulty, so much strife. And if we're supposed to overcome that by ourselves, the, the answer for me is I can't. It, that's just my honest, my honest assessment of myself. But that's not the hope that we have as Christians. In John 1, verses 4 through 5, it says, In him, speaking of Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's our hope. That's who we place our trust in. Jesus, who is the light of the world. And so, many of you might say, yes, David, I... I feel like I have spiritual sight. I see Jesus clearly for who he is. What, is this, what does this mean for me practically? Like what, what do I leave here doing? I want to live in the light. I want to make sure my life reflects that. How do I do that? I tried to boil it down into just two terms. There's obviously a lot more to say um, about that. But I think spiritual sight in action looks like two things. It looks like worship and obedience. We worship and we obey. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be reading in, in Ephesians 5. I, I didn't give this verse because I'm going to be kind of hopping from verse 8 all the way to verse 20. Um, but just so you guys know where I'm at. We're supposed to live changed lives that conform to God's word. And we're also supposed to live lives that worship and honor him. In, in verse 8 of Ephesians 5, it says, For at once you were darkness, but now you are light in the world. So how does that, what does that practically look like? It says, you walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And in verse 11, it says, you take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead you expose them. So simply, what does obedience look like? We walk as children of the light. We take no part in works of darkness. So we avoid the things that we know God hates and abhors. And in fact, we shine a light on them when we see them. And, and we seek in, in turn to have character that reflects the character of Jesus, right? We, we seek to have fruit of the Spirit, right? We seek to, to demonstrate all of those characteristics that are so clearly depicted and demonstrated in the person of Jesus. And in verse 20, it says, And we give thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we obey, we live lives that reflect the character of Jesus, and then we worship God. And by the way, if you're here this morning and you're like, I don't, I don't really know, David. That doesn't really sound like what I want to do with my life. This seems like a suggestion. I, I'm sorry that it came off that way. This is very much not a suggestion for Christians. This is a command. If you look at John 8, 12, where Jesus first Call, call, makes this, the I am statement that he is the light of the world. He says, I am the light of the world. And whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. He did not stutter there. Like this is very clear. This is a command. It is not a suggestion. And in, and in 1 John 1, 5, and 6, it says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. We cannot claim to be followers of Jesus, to see Jesus clearly and, and have our lives be the same, right? We, that's just not an option. And so the reality is when we're, we have spiritual sight, we see Jesus for who he truly is, we live lives that are in the light, we ourselves are supposed to be light, then others will notice. And that's, that's, that's part of the natural progression. We, if we are spiritually sighted, are supposed to help those who are not spiritually sighted to gain their sight. That makes practical sense, right? In, in Matthew 14 through 16, um, this is how, how Jesus depicts that. Because he's already claimed to be the light of the world, right? And then he also tells us that you are the light of the world. A city, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all that are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that 
they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So yes, our lives are supposed to be light of the world. We're supposed to lead others to, to spiritual sight. And I love that. It all comes back to what? So that they might give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We obey, right? The, if you get all the way to Matthew 28, it's a command, right? Like we, we obey when we make disciples, but ultimately we go out to make disciples, not because we, we want to like check this off our list, but because we want more people to worship God. That's what drives, that's really what drives missions. That's what drives our lives. We want many to see Jesus clearly and glorify God. So we're supposed to lead others to the light. And if, if you just practically use that analogy, it makes so much sense, right? It, to, to, to say, um, you know, I'm a Christian, but I don't think I should be I don't feel like I have to do that. I don't feel like it's part of my calling to, to try to lead others to Christ. It, it would be the equivalent of you being in a room with two of your friends who are blind, and you guys are waiting for a movie to start, and some dude from the movie theater comes out with a sign that says, hey, the, the movie is pushed back another 30 minutes and just hands them to your blind friend. And then they hand you one, and you read it, and you're like, oh, okay, so we have time to like go do something else. But you're like, eh, I'll let them two figure it out. That would be the most like hateful and unloving thing that you could do, right? At minimum, you should go and offer, hey, do you guys want me to tell you what the piece of paper said? They very well might turn around and say, no, I don't need your help. They very well might give you a, a, a Pharisee-like answer. But that's not your job. Your job is at least to offer. You're supposed to be their friend. Be a loving friend and say, hey, can I, can I read what's in the paper for you? They're actually saying the movie is 30 minutes late. You have, you have time to do something else if, if you would so like um, so when we, when we practically decide that, eh, let's let blind people figure it out for themselves, it's not a loving thing for us to do. But like I said, the reality is it won't always go well, right? At, at times, you will interact with people much like the Pharisees who are set in their ways, prideful and, and hostile to the truth of Jesus. And when we do that, I think the, the blind man has actually in this passage given us a great game plan of how to interact with these people. Uh, Tony Marita kind of boils it down into four major points of, of what we see from the blind man here. He says, he appeals to facts. He answers directly and briefly. He refuses to argue. And he remains fearless and resolved. And, and that's what we're called to do. Yes, we're called to share the gospel, lead others to Jesus. But at the end of the day, we have to Share the good news and let God do the rest. In 2 Corinthians, it doesn't say that we shine the light in people's hearts, right? It says that God does. Now that we can be instruments of that, absolutely, yes and amen. But we are to share the good news and let God do the rest. So we have seen spiritual blindness. We have seen spiritual sight and demonstrated their interactions with Jesus, who is the light of the world. But ultimately, when the light shines, which is exactly what we see here, it judges. It demonstrates those who see, and it demonstrates those who are prideful and blind, who claim they see but are actually blind. And so that's exactly what Jesus tells the Pharisees in verse 39. He says, For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. What's interesting is in this same gospel, Jesus says and, and will say that he has not come to judge the world. And so, or, or, or that for judgment is, is, that, is that he has come. So how do we make sense of Jesus making both of these statements? Because he has no problem saying both things. He, he has no problem saying that he has not come to condemn the world, but at the same time, he says that for judgment he has come to the world. So how do we reconcile those things? And I think here an analogy might also make sense of it, right? In the same way that we would say this doctor became a doctor so that he or she could save lives, um, at the same time, if that said doctor became an orthopedic surgeon, they might have to amputate someone's limb in order to save their lives, right? So it would be true to say, hey, so-and-so became a doctor to save lives. And it would also be true on that surgery day to say, hey, so-and-so is here to amputate your leg. Both things are true, 
right? In order to save someone's life, he might need to cut, um, cut their limb off. And in the same way, in the same way, we see what Jesus is doing. He has come to save the world, to give light and sight to the blind. And he has also come to demonstrate those who claim to see like the Pharisees are actually blinded by their sin and their pride. Both things are true and real. We know that the, that the Bible says, right, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That is basically the definition here of, of his judgment. And the Pharisees don't like this, obviously, because they, they we, we maybe don't give him enough credit, but they, they at least figure out like, oh my gosh, is he talking about us? I think, I think we're the blind, I think we're the blind people. He must be talking about us. And so they, they quickly try to use his own words against him. They say, okay, if he's gonna call us blind, then he can't say we're guilty of anything, right? Because you, you, don't, you don't blame a blind person. And so, that's, that's what they're thinking. They're like, mm, we found an excuse for ourselves. If we're blind, he can't say that we are guilty. And what's interesting is that Jesus makes it very clear that they're wrong. That they are blind because they love the darkness, not because of some lack of knowledge or revelation that renders them guiltless. I mean, for crying out loud, they have the God of the world in the flesh right in front of them. And they're trying to claim that they're guiltless. In John 3, 19, it says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. That's that's the position that the Pharisees are in. Their, Their prideful blindness does not excuse them, And it frankly does not excuse you. Instead, it is actually what condemns. So in verse 41, Jesus says, if you were blind, right? He's using their own own definitions towards them. He says, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. If that was actually your position, if you actually just did not know or were unaware like this blind man was, you would actually have no guilt. But he tells them, but now that you say, we see your guilt remains. It is, it is their, their prideful blindness that condemns them indefinitely, right? If you are too prideful to admit that you are blind and need the light of the world to see, there is no excuse. There is no excuse, and Jesus makes it very clearly. And I think this is the case even more in our day, right? We might say, oh my gosh, the Pharisees had Jesus in the flesh right in front of them. But think about us. You have so many resources, so, many, so much information at your fingertips. You have no excuse. This reality must lead you to the only one who can give you sight, who can give you life, and that is Jesus himself. And I know it seems, seems really weird to end the sermon uh, just talking about judgment. You're like, man, what a bummer. You know, I I don't like where this sermon is ending. We were up here and now we're all the way down here. But I would actually tell you that that is not true, right? It would have been really, really depressing if my teacher would have said, hey, David, you can't see from back there. I don't know what, you're taking pictures. There's something wrong with your eyesight. And by the way, it's only gonna get worse and in a week you're gonna be blind and you're never gonna recover your eyesight. That's, That's a sad and depressing, like, message to hear, right? Like, that would be really terrible. And in the same way, if I was just here and Jesus was just here telling you, hey, you are spiritually blind, and that's the end of the story, that would be very sad. But that's not where the gospel story ends. That's just not where it ends. We, yes, we were at some point blind. All of us were. Even if you claim to have sight today, we all at some point were blind. But we have a God who is in the redemption business, who gives life to the dead, who brings out of darkness to light, who seeks and saves the lost. There is a God who can give you sight, who can shine in your heart the beauty of Jesus. 
That's good news. That's the good news this dark-filled world needs. And so my charges this morning are real simple. If you're here this morning and, and you're a Christian, you see Jesus clearly, you know and understand your dire need for him, you see him as beautiful as the greatest treasure of your life, then I implore you to come together when we go through communion and during worship to praise Jesus, to praise God for shining the light of Jesus in your hearts and opening your eyes. And if, and if you feel like that's just not the case for you, you just, you're like, I'm not a Christian, I don't see Jesus for who he is, everything you described to the Pharisees, I feel like that's, that's me and my personal walk. And all I can tell you is that only Jesus can give you spiritual sight. Seek him, ask others around you who, who you know and, and who reflect Jesus to help you learn more about him. In this world that is so full of darkness, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. How could we not want to follow him? A testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission, which is to see the gospel like the of his death and raised to walk in newness of life.